Hello there. This is Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv, and I'm here with Amy Wax, uh, professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome to The Glenn Show, Amy. Thank you. I should say welcome back to The Glenn Show. <laughs> yes. How Glad are you? to be here. How are you? How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm okay. Uh, I'm I'm overwhelmed. I'm just uh, deluged with mail and messages and sure. media requests and all sorts of stuff. So that's I'm not really used to that. Uh, but apart from that, I'm doing fine. Well, let me set the stage here. Glenn Lowry at the Glenn Show. Amy Wax at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. This is not the first time you and I have talked no. at bloggingheads.tv. We've talked on at least two other occasions, as I recall, maybe three. Uh, we've talked about some of your past work, and in our most recent conversation, which was in September of last year, you made some comments about the um, academic performance of African-American students at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, which have since, how do they say, gone viral. Um, I will uh, let you say what you want to say about the academic performance of black students at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, but if you'll allow me, I just sort of paraphrase you by saying that in your experience, what you said back in September was that in your experience, you rarely encountered um, or almost never African-American students at the top of the class at the law school and uh, infrequently even in the top half of the class. Um, that comment by you subsequently became publicly known in the basis of a large campaign against you uh, from a number of sources, including your some of your colleagues at the law school who have written open letters castigating you for your views, um, and uh, alumni of the law school, including alumni of color, who have complained that uh, your views unfairly disparage the um, quality of the uh, academic achievements of African Americans who matriculate at the school. Um, your dean has uh, since publicly stated that you would not be permitted to continue teaching this civil procedure course that you have been teaching the first year law students for some years uh, because students ought to be compelled, and this is a required course, to take courses from you, although you were in no way being uh, punished for your speech. This was an administrative decision for which he had reasons and we can go into them. Um, so therefore, a firestorm of protests has uh, developed around this. You've been called a racist, a white supremacist, a segregationist um, in some of the complaint. And um, uh, here we are. Uh, so I thought it imperative that I invite you back on uh, to the video blog here to, um, you know, uh, allow you the opportunity to answer some of these criticisms and to further explore uh, these issues with you, and uh, therefore, I'm very happy that you were willing to do so. Uh, yeah, so, um, Amy, do you have any regrets about having said publicly that uh, you didn't think black students were doing so well ac academically at Penn, and about having relied upon your own uh, subjective experience as a teacher there uh, as part of the basis uh, for for making that judgment. Have you have you had any second thoughts about that? Well, I mean, I regret that I created a firestorm. I regret that certain people were upset by what I said, although I think that's part of the problem that people are extremely thin skinned these days and personalize everything. It's it's a regrettable psychological um, turn. It's also, I think, a kind of political ploy, which once again shuts down openness and conversation. So I do regret all of that. But part of the problem here is that my words were snipped out of a broader conversation. Okay. Uh, we were talking about, uh, if I recall, uh, some of the accusations that are made that our institutions are racist, that the disparities that we see, let's say, in of different groups getting prestigious clerkships or prestigious jobs are due to racism uh, and how there are these alternative possible explanations that have to do with uh, student achievement, where students stand in the class, which of course has nothing to do with these claims that students shouldn't be here, students don't belong here. Rather, it's a matter of trying to head off uh, 
this this little frolic to go root out racism when we have an alternative uh, explanation that's ready to hand. And in that context, I said, I don't think I've ever seen, I was speaking very much from my own experience, uh, never claimed that that was a comprehensive view of the data. Indeed, I said, I don't have the data precisely because the law school doesn't want to reveal it, will not reveal it. That's part, I think, of what's going on today, a lack of openness about results of policies that affect us all. Uh, and that's all I had to go on. Now, the accusation was I shouldn't, or rather the argument is I shouldn't be reporting my own experience. Uh, that's hurtful to the students. It somehow breaches confidentiality, even though I never named any names and there's no way for people to really get the names. Uh, I think some of those uh, arguments are make weight, but there's a broader issue here. If we as professors cannot report our own experiences and discuss them, and the schools will not provide any information, then the bottom line is that these policies and their results cannot ever be discussed. They are taboo, they are off the table, they are banned and verboten. That is the bottom line from these rules. Uh, and that means that the powers that be, these very powerful institutions, with their priorities uh, and their practices are immune from question, immune from accountability. Uh, we have no capacity to assess and evaluate policies and steps that affect people in very critical ways. Uh, so I don't think that I don't, I think there needs to be a balance between openness and privacy. That is my, my position. Okay, okay, so I, I want to come to the questions about transparency with respect to affirmative action in a moment. But I first want to talk about uh, the question of what are our responsibilities. I'm a college professor like you. I've been doing this for 40 years. And I have my own classroom experiences and my own impressions on the basis of them. And I've said yeah. publicly, I've said publicly, in fact, in defense of you, Amy, that um, you know, if I look over the course of the years and I've been teaching University of Michigan, Northwestern University, uh, Harvard, you know, Boston University, and now at Brown, um, on the whole, I do have certain judgments about uh, uh, the average level of performance of students who are coming from different kinds of backgrounds. I found my Asian students, for example, on the whole, not without exceptions, to be very, very strong, to cluster near the top of the class. My Jewish students, frankly, I have to say this, on the whole, and again, not without exceptions, um, but observing those things is one thing. Speaking publicly about them is another. And I, I really wanna get your candid reaction to the concerns that I and other people might share about the public speaking when we categorize by ethnicity or race the performance on the average of groups of people. So let me give you a hypothetical and, I, and I'll step back and let you talk. Uh, suppose I'm a police commander of a precinct in a big city and I'm dealing with crime. And suppose as an objective matter of fact, most of the crime, a vastly disproportionate amount of it is committed by black offenders. And I'm on the uh, local news and I'm asked some question or I'm engaged in some interview and I make the statement that in my experience, I regret this, I take no pleasure in telling you, but the fact of the matter is, most of the criminals in this city are black. Most of the violence that's being perpetrated against innocent people is being perpetrated by black offenders. How can you expect me not to notice that? That's mm -hmm. just a fact of life and we have to come to grips with it. Now, that person uh, may have been stating objectively correct facts about the coloration, if you will, of criminal offending in the city, but that person is likely to be A, to end up in a lot of hot water for having said that people are gonna demand his or her head on a platter, but B, will probably have undermined the effectiveness of policing in that city by lending credence to the suspicions of so many people that whenever there's some ambiguous circumstance in which a kid is being arrested and the cop has to rough him up, it's because it's those racist cops who are going out there with a mindset that's saying all the people are black. 
Now, one of the things that your dean has said in defense of his decision to have you not be teaching required courses anymore at the Penn Law School to first year law students is, how can they be sure that you will evaluate them objectively? And I'm just wondering whether you give any credence at all to the concern that regardless of the objective validity of your statements or of your motives for making them, the fact of the statements itself, given your position in the classroom, is and in the way that's not dissimilar from that hypothetical police commander whom I was just describing, uh, unproductive and unhelpful in the, at the least, and perhaps even a bit unprofessional uh, if we were going to push this. What would you say to that concern? Well, there's a lot here, but let me just say a couple of things. First, I'll start with how do we know that she's not going to be biased against the students. First of all, there are safeguards in place at law schools against that. There's something called blind grading. I have no idea what grade I am giving to which students. I actually give a short answer test that a, a mul multiple choice test is graded by a machine. I have, I have validated that test. I have nothing to do with grading it. I don't know who gets which grade until the end. Even when I gave an essay test, I had no idea who got which grade. That really needs to be clarified. All right, that system is in place for a reason. Also, we're on a forced curve. So I cannot manipulate through grade inflation, grading people up and down, and I never have graded anybody up or down. Now, people will say, well, maybe she's biased in the classroom. No one has ever complained of that until the past year or so when it's become a kind of weapon in this war of you know, getting Amy Wax who expresses opinions we don't like marginalized or otherwise neutralized. Uh, I've never had an allegation of discrimination in grading or in treatment of students leveled against me. And I, there are black students that I have helped out. I just helped out one within the past week by giving him a very high level connection to a very important person. Uh, so I just, I, I'm sorry, I do not cop to that. And I think these are, these are make weight sort of psychologized thin skins complaints. I have a problem with that attitude that sees racism everywhere and the danger of racism everywhere. That's a broader conversation. Okay. The second thing I would say about the police, uh, police uh, officer chief is the following. Is that remark pertinent? Why would he make that observation? I think that observation is gratuitous if it's just made off the cuff. But here is a point that is very critical, and I, I am about to publish a Wall Street Journal op-ed that makes that point. Often, the observation that certain groups as a whole underperform or exemplify certain behavioral patterns is a defensive move in reaction to accusations of racism. So I'll take an example, all right? Why does your law firm not have more black partners? Why does your law firm not hire more black associates? Why can we not find, I'm going to switch over to the medical side because I think it's even starker in academic medicine, diversity and inclusion people accusingly saying, why don't you have a candidate for the chief of radiology who's black? That's your problem. And the individuals say, well, actually, you're accusing us of something we're not guilty of, bigotry. We have an alternative explanation. There is one or two, there are one or two people, maybe there are no people in the whole nation who would qualify as the chief of department X at this top ranked medical school who are underrepresented minorities. The pipeline is dry. Are we not allowed to say that, Glenn? I can tell you because I've talked to people in academic medicine. You're not allowed to say that. It's guilty as charged. If you are accused of racism, to deny racism is proof of racism. And that's where we are right now. Well, let, me, let me just interrupt for a minute, Amy. There are a lot of things that you're not allowed to say, and there are good reasons for people not being allowed to say them. It's okay to not be allowed to say some things sometimes. Here's something that I'm not allowed to say. You talk about the hashtag MeToo moment and sexual harassment. Well, there are some women in the workplace who use their sexuality to get ahead in life. 
I'm yes. not allowed to say that, okay? Let me just repeat for the audiences. I didn't actually say it. I only <laughs> ha hypothetically said it by way of illustrating what I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> But do you see my point? I mean, there's a You're reason still why. You're still going to get in trouble. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I can live with that. But but I'm just, I mean, it, since I'm making the point, contrary to your point, I might get a pass this time. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is there are reasons for uh, censorship and self-censorship and restraint. It's called the maintenance of civility. It's that some things which are true and obvious, you know what? I've been to that couple's house. They're not really in love with each other don't get said. They don't get said in public because they're hurtful of people, because they're poisoning the well of whatever the social arrangement is within the context of which such statements will be made, because they raise profound questions about the motive of the speaker. She knows you're not supposed to say that. Why is she saying it? She tells me her cover story is she's just trying to give an analysis of this or that or the other. Well, she's flagrantly violating the taboo in order to call attention to herself, in order to derogate the people on the butt end of the things that she's saying and so forth and so on. So um, a restraint in what we say isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily an in indication of, uh, of uh, bad faith. It, it may be a kind of decorum and uh, a respect for civility that it exists for a good reason. What, 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 and, and in the racial area, in the area of race in America, where everybody is so sensitive and the thing is so fraught, this is especially the case. <clears throat> well, as a general matter, I can't disagree with you. I think we need to take it case by case. So let's take the case of the the profound violation of fair play. And I will I will say that it is a profound violation of basic fair play to disable someone, to bar someone from defending themselves against an accusation of racism and bigotry by pointing to an alternative explanation for inequality of outcome. And let's be clear here, Glenn, the, the original sin here, I think, or the, the let's call it a, a problem, is this, this unrelenting demand for equality of outcome. There has to be equality of outcome. So here's how it goes. Where are the minority, you know, professors of medicine? You have to find them. They have to be there. No excuses. You must. And we have a whole army of diversity and inclusion people who are dedicated to hammering on you. They sit in on these appointments. Uh, meetings. Uh, they are guardians of giving out money, grant money, and they're saying to these poor, hapless people, you know, you, your grant is going to be pulled unless you find some black and Hispanic people to hire for your department. And then you're telling these people, okay, guilty as charged. You may not say, you may not even say but it's not that we're bigoted. It's not that we're racist. No one would love to see black and Hispanic people in our department more than we would. The reason they're not there is the paucity of these people in med school. Once they get there, they don't go into academic medicine. Uh, they're not at the top echelons of the class. They don't do what's necessary to qualify. I mean, all of that that discourse now you're telling me cannot be conducted. Well, okay, but I think it's natural for people to get frustrated, even to get resentful that accusations amount to guilty as charged. Uh, to deny racism is to be racist. You must acquiesce in all charges of racism. Uh, these are the rules. I, I mean, it has the culture war is won if if those rules are being imposed, but the political war goes on because people resist. They resist. I don't think it's it's a you know a lack of decorum to resist. I don't think it shows a lack of restraint to resist that kind of accusation. It is a nefarious accusation in our society. So okay. to say, well, all of this 
this factual information now cannot be talked about. It's off limits. We're den you must deny reality. That's hard to hard to enforce that, Glenn. Yeah, um, I'm I'm not entirely convinced, Amy. Uh, although I, I take the point that uh, charges are being thrown about of racism to which people will want to respond by calling attention to performance differences across the races, which is an alternative explanation for low that numbers. That says it in a nutshell. I, I think that says I, it now. Are you telling me that they shouldn't be allowed to do no, that? No. Uh, well, I'm, I want to go back to my analogy about the hashtag Me Too. People say, believe the women. <clears throat> and I mean, I know you know uh, probably a lot more about this than I do being a woman and being a law professor, and these are legal issues. Um, but um, the... Uh, effort of men to defend themselves, this is an analogy that I'm trying to draw, okay, the effort of men to defend themselves uh, against charges of uh, misconduct by um, impugning the credibility of women is taken to be not only a tactical maneuver in the context of a particular case, but also a kind of derogation of women more broadly and a contribution to a social attitude uh, in which um, the integrity of women's bodies or the autonomy of women in terms of sexuality is not fully respected. <coughs> Likewise, we live in a culture in which there are rumors of the inferiority of African Americans. There are suspicions about the capacities of black people to actually function in a manner that's uh, competitive with uh, those of others. There are two broad accounts to explain this disparity, one of them is about uh, bias in institutions, and the other is about either the inherent, you know, genetic endowment or the cultural predispositions and attitudes at some deep level or uh, whatever uh, of the African American society. And um, when people's essential worth is on the table, you can expect them to fight for their lives. Um, if you disparage the academic performance of blacks as a group at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, who can be surprised that black alumni will mobilize themselves in defense of their reputations because that disparagement, however factually accurate it might be, uh, goes right at the at the it, it's it, it grabs them at the throat. Um, it 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 uh, in, in it jeopardizes their essential uh, sense of uh, status and and self worth. Um, so don't you have some responsibility when those are the stakes, just as I have a responsibility. I have my views about hashtag me too. Um, when one of my uh, colleagues came in and a woman and reprimanded me for something I put up on Facebook in which I liked an article from an anti-feminist woman writer that had said, come on, come on, come on. We know that women put on makeup and, and wear their clothes and so forth in order to appeal to men. And I said, you know, that's right. That's right. And this woman came into my office and she said, do you know the impact that this is going to have on the younger female colleagues in this department where you are a senior member sitting in judgment of their tenure and so forth? She wasn't accusing me of doing anything to anybody. She was saying, though, that I had a responsibility not to conduct myself in public in ways that would cause my colleagues, in this case, younger females, to feel insecure. Don't you, we, have a similar responsibility to conduct ourselves, even as we battle these issues about the facts and about how important this racism is and discrimination and so forth, and ways that don't go for the jugular of uh, self-respect and standing of our um, of our African American fellow citizens and of our students uh, at at, uh, at our universities. Well, go for the jugular is a loaded term. I mean, I was making a point in as part of a conversation, not intending to belittle or denigrate any particular person, but rather to make a point about alternative explanations. Now, what you seem to be saying to me is the facts don't really matter. We, we, it, there are no consequences to either Excuse denying me. or ignoring the facts. I, I don't well, understand no, no, I just where want the to clarify. facts figure in to I your wanna, view of things. I want to clarify. I'm saying the facts are not the only thing that matter. I'm not saying the facts don't matter. I'm saying other things matter too. And one needs to be circumspect in how one discusses the facts when these other things are, are salient and really important as they are in our discourse about women or about African-Americans in this society. Uh -huh. That's what I'm saying. Well, 
I mean, I would have two questions to that. The first is very concrete, and I'll put it on the table. Um, in the example I gave of, you know, a meeting of trying to select a chair of a particular medical school department, uh, what should people say? Should they just sit there and and take it and just listen to the diversity officer and not say a thing, recognizing that uh, bad consequences will follow. They might have their grant pulled because they can't do the impossible, but that's just the cost of doing business. So that that would sort of, you know, be my my first question. The second is, I think there is just a real step back, larger psychological point, and part of this is just generational. Uh, it is hard for me to understand. Personally, I'm 65 years old. I came of age in another era. Uh, how someone could feel personally damaged by a mere statement of fact, however inconvenient and unpleasant. So if someone says to me, um, you know, there are women, I'm not sure what the pertinence of this point is, but let's just take the point. There are women who use their sexuality in the workplace to get ahead. Uh, and sometimes create traps for unwary men, given male sexuality and, you know, their eagerness to to enjoy sex where it's offered. Um, I would say, OK, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not going to feel personally insulted by that. Uh, it just not the way I think about things. I think this is an interesting observation. Is it true? What is the implication? What does it mean? Let's be realistic about the way people actually behave. Uh, the truth will set you free. We have to start from an accurate view of reality. I mean, that is a whole different mindset. I think what we have now is a generation of people who, uh, be, spend so much mental energy, cognitive energy, looking for insults, looking for instances to feel attacked and aggrieved. Uh, and that, you have to wonder how that is going to affect their personal and professional performance. I'm very concerned about it. I think, yeah. this is my opinion, that uh, students, and I'm not going to single out minority students, but I know they're particularly invested in this project of, you know, rooting out every little hint of racism. Uh, here's how I view it. This sounds really old fashioned. Why are they not in the library studying bankruptcy? I mean, when I was in law school, this is a true story. I said, holy cow, this stuff is hard. I, there are people here, I was first year student at Harvard Law School, who are smarter than I am. I am really going to have to kick butt. This is a full time job. This material is demanding. It is analytically hard. I need to get really serious if I propose to become an excellent professional. And that is my central mission. I don't see that attitude in as many students today as I would like to see. And I think it's going to tell in the long term because it's going to produce a lot of disappointment. Yeah. OK, I, I got to ask you this because you've been accused of uh, thinking that uh, the African-American students at Penn and presumably elsewhere are not up to it. Um, do you think they're inferior? Well, the word inferior is so loaded. I yeah. do. I let me let me uh, answer this question. Do I think that uh, their efforts are expended uh, in the right direction? Do I think that they are doing everything that is necessary to be the best they can be? I would have to say no to that. Based on my experience again, Glenn, uh, my observations. Inferior is a word that it just it's so nonspecific. I know I don't think they're inferior. Do you think at, do you think that they are not capable of measuring up at a competitive place like Penn? 
uh, I would say they are capable because Penn, uh, the students at Penn, not Glenn, not everybody can be in the top 20%, okay? So uh, people, that's definitional, all right? People who come to Penn represent a range of abilities and I don't have prior knowledge of the, but I will tell you this, Glenn, I have to say this, all right? There is affirmative action. What does affirmative action mean? It means that people uh, are admitted of under such programs under different quantitative standards. It's whether you like it or not, that is true. So just take the LSAT. People want to bury these facts. They really want to bury them. I understand it. Of uh, the average LSAT of blacks overall, because these data are available, is less than the average LSAT of whites and Asians. Um, I someone told me today, and I haven't verified it, uh, that there are no students in year X. Very recently, black students who scored over 171 on the LSAT, whereas there are. I think hundreds, even thousands of black and, I mean, excuse me, white and Asian students who have, you know, people have been deluging me with data and with statistics. Uh, but these are well-known facts. And the LSAT is predictive. We don't like that. Uh, it's an inconvenient fact, but it is. So we can deny reality, we can bury reality uh we can ignore reality maybe we can get away with it now here's the other thing let's ignore let's ignore this stuff who cares about this stuff who cares about what grades people get why do we fetishize it why don't we even notice it well we notice it because once people get out in the real world these measures have consequences uh they have consequences whether we like it or not, and imperfectly, very much imperfectly, uh, in predicting how people perform in the tasks that they are required to perform in their professional lives, uh, in their work lives. So why do judges look at your grades? Why are judges in hiring clerks obsessed with grades? I mean, if you have one B plus on your transcript or even A minus, you can forget about getting a Supreme Court clerkship. Why are Supreme Court justices even paying attention to that stuff? Uh, and of course they are. Well, it's because they're looking not for the top 20%, but for the top 2%. And uh, a transcript is probably a pretty good indicator of whether or not a person's in the top 2%. Um, but the question is whether in the broad venues in which people leave law school and go on to have productive careers, this kind of thing is uh, that important. I don't know what uh, <laughs> Johnny Cochran's LSAT score was. I just throw the name out, but you get sure. the point. He's the guy that got O.J. Simpson off. And if you can do that, you must not be too bad a lawyer, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Uh, but I, I want to go back to something else that you were saying about how people, African-American people, deal with the challenge that they confront when they enter a, a elite institution and they have to compete for status. And they think that others around them may be looking askance at their presence there. You know, you don't belong here, we have affirmative action, you're black, you don't belong here, you're taking someone else's seat. And it strikes me that broadly speaking, uh, one can either dismiss and give the back of one's hand to those thoughts, you're a racist, you're accusing me of being inferior, you're a racist. Or you can work hard to try to dispel. You think I'm not good enough, but let me show you what I can do. And it's very interesting. I, I, I don't want to misquote you, but I believe I've heard you say in a past conversation that when you were coming up as a Jewish woman in the community that you grew up in, uh, very much it was this idea of that go out there. If you have to work three times as hard, go and work three times as hard. We know there's anti-Semitism. That's just the way the world is. Let's get busy, which is the dispel strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, but can you understand how some people might be uh, really attracted by the dismiss strategy because they don't have confidence 
that the institutions are really going to reward them if they do the things they need to do to, quote, dispel. They don't believe that they're going to get the benefit of the doubt or that there's going to be a revision of belief or whatever. Um, now, some of the protest culture amongst, you know, contemporary social critics like ta Coates comes to mind or that you hear from the podium as people are giving speeches encourages this pessimism. Yes. But American history also, to some degree, encourages this pessimism, doesn't it? I put that as a question. And, and you know, I, I mean, I'm struck by this, and I'll stop because I don't want to monopolize. The politics of respectability is what my students, my African-American students, trot out whenever I say, you know, pull up your socks, pull up your pants, put your nose to the grindstone, get busy. There's opportunity in this country. People are coming here from every corner of the world to seize that opportunity. It's our birthright as citizens, many generations uh, on uh, let's get busy seizing the opportunity, get busy. And they say, Professor Law, you just want us to practice the politics of respectability. I'm not living in some white person's head. It's not my job to make Amy Wax think I'm smart. Just like that. Besides, anything I do is never going to convince Amy Wax or the Amy Waxes of the world that I'm smart. Um, and while I lament this uh, posture, I can't say that there's a part of me that doesn't understand it. Um, in my own biography, you know, things have worked out okay. I'm the Merton Stowe's professor at an Ivy League university, so I guess I, I guess I'm, uh, you know, I guess I made it. I guess you know I, I can stop looking over my shoulder now. But that's rare. That's 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 very very rare. Most people live in a different a different kind of world. So you know, that's the end of my speech. But that I, I just wanted to put that on the table. Well, you know, I think we have a fundamental disagreement. I think respectability is a wonderful thing, regardless of your race, creed, color, gender. I think respectability is a script, a set of guidelines and guideposts that are simple rules for simple people. And we're all simple. We all need those, that guidance. Uh, we need those rules to keep us from going wrong because the default, of course, uh, we're all fallen and original sin. And that's conservatives understand that uh, norms, traditions, institutions, and, you know, that heaven help us list of bourgeois values is there Heaven to help us. guide us and <laughs> to assist us uh, in avoiding self-defeating behavior. I don't think that that has a color or creed. Um, so I, I really, it, dismaying to me to hear people talk in these uh, dismissive tones of the politics of respectability. I think that is uh, really self-defeating, terribly self-defeating. The other problem is that, um, you know, I think too many minorities have what we call in medicine ideas of reference. They think everybody's standing around judging them every single minute. They're not. They just want to get the job done. If you are a businessman, for example, my father was a small businessman and he honestly and truly did not care who you were, what your background was, what color you were. He just wanted the work in his little small business done well and done right because he wanted to make a buck. I mean, he was just this bottom line kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, so I think there is a lack of a principle of charity here almost towards other human beings to think that they are judging you and judging you in this negative way. No, I actually think most people uh, are willing and eager to give others. They have goodwill toward uh, the benefit of the doubt. They have goodwill towards other people, uh, minorities, they they don't want to be proven wrong in in extending that to others. So once again, I'm going to go back to my point. All of this energy, all of this attention, psychological, cognitive uh, energy and attention towards worrying about, thinking about grievances, racism, obstacles instead of just getting on with it. I mean, getting on with it might not be as interesting. It's certainly not as psychologically protective in that 
you know, if you believe that the whole world is set against you, that it's imbued with racism, that the obstacles are almost insurmountable, then that becomes uh, a ever present reason for failure or rationale for failure. Well, we all need that because we're all going to fail now and again. Um, I understand it from that point of view. I just don't think it's terribly realistic at the present time. And I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. This is a question of how important it is in the grand scheme of things today. And as Heather McDonald points out at these universities and colleges, especially these elite institutions, but maybe all of them, I mean, no more protected, unracist, unbiased, generous environment can be imagined in the entire history of mankind. I think uh, that's a realistic assessment. You're in academia. You tell me if I'm wrong. We disagree about some things, but not about that. Uh, these institutions are just about as open, just about as objectively meritocratic, and just about as predisposed toward a progressive, in quotes, liberal, in quotes, uh, kind of uh, tolerant um, uh, conduct of their affairs as one can imagine institutions being. That's my impression after 40 years of uh, working in these institutions. Uh, Amy. So you're asking uh, for perfection here, but perfection will never come. No, no, hold on, let me ask you something. Uh, a lot of people have been hurt. I mean, you can surely see the pain between the lines of the angry denunciations and the, you know, the letters that have been written and the so on and so forth. Sure, sure, sure. Some of it is unfair attack on you, and I want to state here publicly and for the record uh, that I think Dean Ruger, is that how you pronounce his name? Yes. Ruger, uh, acted reprehensibly in uh, removing you from a classroom because of your opinions about something. And that's what I think happened. He has got a cover story about uh, why he's removing you from the required class. But in my view, at the bottom, uh, the bottom line of all of that is that you've been taken out of those classrooms because you have opinions that some people find to be offensive. And I think that's reprehensible. On the other hand, a lot of people have been hurt. There's just a lot of pain. OK, students wondering if I take her class and I'm black, is she going to be looking at me differently? Now, you've answered. You've answered that you would not. I believe you. I take you at your word about that. I have no reason to suspect that you're not telling the truth about that. But nevertheless, are there people out there, people out there who are feeling already insecure? Because, as you say, they face a daunting challenge. If they come with a lower LSAT score, or with a lower college GPA and less acute preparation, and they're in this competitive hothouse and they're trying to make law review and they want to get the clerkship, they're already on the defensive. And then this comes. So would you be willing to consider saying to those people that you're sorry, not about having an opinion or about having an assessment of the facts, but about the consequences of your having spoken public in such a way being so deleterious for them? Well, you know, I could, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm not trying to be stubborn when I, I'm telling you I don't know how to answer that question. I guess saying I'm sorry buys into uh, a certain mindset, you know, that this is hurtful for someone to, to state observations of objective reality is hurtful. Uh, that I am reluctant to to accede to because, as I said before, um, being hurt by reality is almost kind of a category mistake. I mean, Rousseau once said, nature cannot be unjust. Uh, and, you know, facts cannot be hurtful, especially when those facts are well known. I mean, they... They are part of sort of the landscape. Now, I recognize that many of the students really have been protected from these facts. They have been systematically sheltered from the facts. Uh, and I think that's a, a bad thing because they uh, cannot then cope with reality. At some point in their life, they will be confronted by facts uh, that they think, wow, I wish that weren't true. That's really inconvenient. Uh, that, what does that say about 
and once again they're personalizing doesn't really say anything about them uh, but about the group I belong to or the culture I belong to uh, or the like um, I just think at the end of the day it's always better when people start from the premise of truth now call me old-fashioned you know maybe that's just prejudice on my part academics I think it is of the essence of what it means to be an academic to confront and respect the truth now you're right we don't sort of out people with really nasty facts just for its own sake for no purpose and I'm going to agree with you about that uh, so for a police chief to say something like you know blacks commit most of the crimes in this town when it's not connected to any action that he has taken or any justification for a policy is just gratuitous I agree with you about that but we do have to formulate policies in our society they do have costs uh, as well as benefits some people bear the cost they bear them silently because they have been silenced uh, if we're going to create rules for our society as a whole isn't it better that we get the facts out on the table you may not agree with that I I still believe uh, that that is the case no nah, I, I think that we cannot possibly talk about every fact and so we're necessarily even when we restrict ourselves to things that are demonstrably true when we speak editing our speech by selecting those true things that we want to enunciate and I think that that's that is um, uh, leaves us with a moral responsibility to exercise that discretion in a, in a manner that's commensurate with some principles that you say gratuitous assertion of racial differences and criminal offending by a police officer i agree that's a bad thing um i think a focus on the test score differences of students by race once they've been admitted they are now a part of the community um while factual and perhaps even pertinent to a policy like affirmative action i want to ask dean ruger if i ever got a chance to talk to him i would ask him this he mm -hmm. says he says, we don't collect data on student grades by race. And I'm saying, why not? To myself, I'm saying, why not? Because you admit people by race. If I know, as I do, <clears throat> as you pointed out, that there are huge disparities by race, at least at the average in the performance on the law school um, admissions test, and the blacks on the whole score lower, and a place like Penn is selecting from the right tail of that distribution, and it's got whatever the percentage of African-Americans are that you've got, <clears throat> I don't know that number. Let's say it's 10 percent. Let's say it's 15 percent. Almost surely some of those people who are African-American who have been admitted uh, have lower LSAT scores than the average white person or Asian person who has been admitted. That's certainly true. And I want to ask Dean Ruger, well, if that's what you're doing, don't you check afterwards to see whether or not that was a good idea to, to see? I mean, he, he makes certain assertions and I want to talk about the facts. We don't we can't go on forever here, but I want to give you a chance to talk about facts. the dean makes assertions that. Well, blacks have graduated at the top of Penn's law school. Frankly, Amy, I must say, I find that hard not to believe that there couldn't be some black person, not even one, not even one. So when you say none, I, I kind of want to say, oh, come on, that can't be true. What she really means is few. But in any case, um, uh, uh, I want to know whether or not the implication of using different criteria for admitting students to the <coughs> school manifest itself in terms of discernible differences in the performance of students once they've been admitted. And the dean should want to know that too, because affirmative action is not just either you do it or you don't. It's how much of it that you do. It's how much of a thumb you put on the scale. There, as you said, are costs and there are benefits. Those costs vary with the intensity of the policy, as do the benefits. So a prudent management of the affirmative action practice, it seems to me, would require collecting data. You might not want to make it public, but for internal administrative purposes, you would want to know so that you could calibrate, so that you could say, yeah, we overshot. I think we went too far or we're not. We could do more. We could we could even be more aggressive in our affirmative action policy. Anyway, again, I'm not trying to uh, filibuster here. Sure, facts matter. Sure, facts matter. But we can't possibly talk about everything that's a fact. So we're making judgments as we edit ourselves with respect to the things that we discuss and some kinds of discussions, if they are not 
oriented toward a productive process that pr produces an outcome that moves us uh, further toward our objectives will be hurtful to people and uh, will in some sense have been, you know, not worth the candle. I, I mean, once again, I can't <clears throat> disagree with this generalization. I think we need to look at specific <clears throat> uses for which the, to which the facts are put. So, you know, we need to look at specific examples. So I gave you two specific examples. One was uh, a medical school chief of service search, for example, where a, a diversity and inclusion officers are in there hammering on people, uh, threatening to take away their funds and the like. Um, so I guess the question I would have for you is, should they just sit there and should they not be allowed to say the pipeline is is dry uh, as a way to deal with that? Because it has real consequences if, if they don't come up with these people. It could potentially have real consequences uh, for the existing faculty. The second example uh, was I believe one that I gave you before, um, you know, sitting in the clerkship committee, having people say, well, there must be racism. We don't have blacks getting yeah. these clerkships and we're going to have an investigation and we're going to have an initiative. Now, investigations and initiatives cost time. They cost money. Yeah. They uh, require effort. Uh, they involve all of this kabuki theater. Uh, and for me to say, well, I don't want to be drawn into that. When there's a simple, straightforward explanation, I think it's a waste of our institutional resources. It's a waste of our time and our money to go chasing after something uh, that is not responsive and pertinent. Um, that, I think, is a situation in which it is justified to. And now I ended up discussing it with you publicly. So you will say, well, you could say that, but you can't talk about it openly because it's too hurtful to the students. Um, once again, you know, the students are being protected from important questions about how institutions are run. Someday they are going to have to go out there and run those institutions. Sooner or later, those questions are going to come up. Okay. And I, yeah, let, let me ask you, Amy. Um, so we've got various venues where people rise up. They make a lot of money. Some people make a seven figures a year in this society, as I know you know. Some of your students are going on within 10 years of leaving your place to be making seven figures at some of these hedge funds and investment banks and so forth. Uh, people who make partner in one of these big firms in D.C. or New York or Chicago or L.A. are making big bucks. Do you think all those people are the smartest people to come out of law school? Do you think there's yeah. anything such as an old boys network? Do you think that elites tend to reproduce themselves by picking people who look like them, talk like them, dress like them, uh, embrace certain cultural practices and traits that they're familiar with? Uh, do you think there can be something like a cult of smartness where uh, my son is a data scientist in Silicon Valley and he tells me oh. about the interview process, you know, where they're interviewing these young 23 year old uh, crackerjack coders. And it's like logic puzzles and all of this kind of uh, gaming and stuff like that, where can you solve this problem? <clears throat> and they're trying to see how the person's mind works. <clears throat> well, sure. Some of that cleverness is important to productivity in the work environment, but presumably other kinds of human traits, creativity and insight and whatnot would also be important, but are not well measured by that. So I'm really asking you about meritocracy here because a lot of your argument is resting on the idea that the outcomes are somehow people are differentiated by their abilities, that the people with the greater ability rise to the top, and that when you muck around with that with something like affirmative action, you're generating significant consequences. And a lot of the pushback that I've gotten when I've made similar arguments from people is you need to actually go to work in a law firm and see who makes partner. You think making partner is an IQ test? You need to think again. You need to go to some of these hedge funds and investment banks and see who are the people who end up getting brought along as protégés of the people who are at the top. You think it's all about their test score? You're a fool. It's not about their test score. It's about what, whether they're wearing a beard, what kind of suit they've got on. Do they make fun, you know, make good jokes when you're, you know, it's the after hour drinks and people are sitting around and whatnot and stuff like that. So so if it's not really a meritocracy, if some of that critique of the hierarchical structure of society and the deservingness of people who are at the top is valid, why not uh, in the interest of uh, of getting uh, more uh, ex previously excluded and disadvantaged people in, why not uh, relax a little bit some of these criteria that we et cetera? 
Well, first of all, I think you've really set up quite a straw man here, you know, it's sort of all <laughs> or none. Uh -huh. No one, no one thinks that. Even the most IQ essentialist person on the planet doesn't think that. They <laughs> understand that uh, intelligence or whatever it is that we want to call it, cognitive ability, is not all of it. And there is a whole science out there about this, Glenn. There are people who study, it's called industrial and organizational psychology. Uh, people study this stuff in great detail. Uh, there's enormous amounts of data. I actually wrote a big piece on disparate impact in which I looked at this literature. Um, they have quantified the extent to which uh, pure intelligence is predictive versus conscientiousness, other personality traits, extroversion, social dominance. We're not writing on a blank slate here at all, Glenn. So no one is claiming this. Now, here's the problem with certain professions. So let's take law. Law covers a range of functions and activities and law firms. Uh, you know, I live in this rarefied world of appellate law and, um, you know, highly analytical, the highly analytical little sections of law. Uh, in those quarters, um, cognitive ability, whether we like it or not, it counts for a lot. Does it count for everything? No, but it really does matter. I think in the profession as a whole, there's a certain degree of, of smarts that uh, are, it, is important and that on average smarter people do it better than less smart people now having said that if you go to any given law firm an elite law firm a middling law firm uh, a country law firm a city law firm you're going to get what's called a restriction and range effect the people who are in that firm will have an ability level that is more or less similar to other people in that firm so you don't see a lot of range as you would if you just went out randomly and picked off people on the street, right? And then you'd see the full uh, bell curve, so to speak. So once you restrict the range of ability, then other traits become dominant and more important. Go to Yale Law School, which gets the pick of the litter, you know, the top of the heap. Well, Frankly, there's not that much difference in LSATs between the people at Yale Law School. So other characteristics like diligence, determination, ambition, personality, conscientiousness, style, yeah. looks, yeah. they're going to dominate. So, you know, this is well known. Our impressions about these things uh, are imperfect because we don't step yeah. back yeah, and I, I, realize uh, we're not seeing the whole picture. No, I, I think right? it's a, a really important methodological point that, that you're making that I just want to underscore, uh, which is that if you're selecting on ability and you are uh, elite, and so we're talking about the top 10%, the top 5%, or 1%. The 1%. We're talking about so, 1%. So so everybody is within a, a dot or a tittle from being at the top of the heap in that respect. And therefore when we examine who succeeds and who doesn't, exactly. we're likely to have to attribute that to other characteristics, not to their uh, how sharp they were <clears throat> because everyone was pretty sharp coming in. And then someone who comes along and says it's not a meritocracy because look, the guy who made partner really made partner because he wore the right suit right. has has really missed the point. It is a meritocracy because even to be able to get into the set of people being considered for the slot, you had to be meritorious according to conventional criteria, even if when we see who among those few who were in that position actually succeeded, we find that other factors are, are significant. I, I think that's an important... Right, and restriction uh, and range mistakes are everywhere. I mean, it just over and over and over again, people are making the same mistakes. Now, the other point that is important quite vital is so once you get within a certain range of ability level addition you know increments of ability don't matter so we have this kind of Malcolm Gladwell threshold idea yeah. now that idea has a lot of appeal the problem is the evidence doesn't back it up yeah. so 
this guy, David Lubinsky, has a very interesting data set at Vanderbilt. He tested 13-year-olds on the SAT and took, you know, the very top echelon. These are kids who have 650 and above on the math or the verbal. They're in the top 0.01%. Oh, 13-year-olds, yeah. yeah. Because at that age, you don't get this ceiling effect that shows up in 17-year-olds, you know, yeah. where 3% of males get an 800 on the math SAT. So it's actually not that good at differentiating the really, really, really smart from the smart. Yeah. However, he then followed them over time and he looked at how they did in terms of getting degrees, publishing papers, getting prizes, success, right? The kids from 650 up to 800, because now we have a range, even within the tippy, tippy, tip top of the distribution, we have a range of very smart, just super, super, super smart. Does it matter which category you're in for future achievement? Answer, yes. So I'm not surprised to hear step, that. Lock step up the scale in terms of, wow, when you get an 800 at age 13, you will do better in life on average than if you have a 650. And we're talking about this very rarefied group here. This is okay. average. Okay, average. Amy, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but we're, we're, we're kind of out of time. And I want to ask you one, one final question. Um, Richard Sander. Yes. Okay, so he's a law professor at UCLA. So he is uh, the author, uh, the, the uh, progenitor of this mismatch hypothesis, which you've mentioned previously in an appearance when we've been discussing these issues at the Glenn Show. That's the hypothesis that kids who are benefiting from affirmative action, African-American youngsters, young students, might be better served if uh, they weren't matched at, if they weren't placed at the most, most, most elite and competitive institutions where their personal um, achievement and mastery of skills puts them toward the bottom of the class, they'd be better off to go to a less uh, prestigious. Okay, that's Richard Sander. As you know, uh, his 2004 Stanford Law uh, Review article has come in for fierce criticism from all quarters. And Sander himself has taken a lot of the same kind of hits that you're taking and with some of the same kind of accusations for daring to uh, speculate that it might be that there'd be even more black lawyers if you had less affirmative action, because when people are mismatched, they end up not passing the bar, not doing as well in terms of their GPAs, and sometimes not even uh, successfully uh, graduating. <laughs> Here's the question. <clears throat> Sanders' provocative speculations are based upon voluminous statistical analysis of massive mountains of data that he goes through very, very carefully. And he's not perfect, and statisticians will criticize him. But if you pick up that 2004 Stanford University Law Review article by Richard Sander and you take a look at it, you'll see that's a serious engagement with the data. Here's the question, Amy. You are uh, put yourself into the position of provocateur in terms of saying some things that you assert to be factual, and I'm not questioning whether or not they're factual. But you're not able to do so on the basis of a mountain of voluminous evidence and a disciplined, uh, years-long, uh, sort of careful scholarly investigation. People, your critics, think of you more as a gadfly, as somebody who cherry picks, as somebody who's not really a deep scholar about these matters. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to respond to that criticism. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of different ways to make a point. I had a, had a conversation with you in which I reported my experience by way of making a broader point about how we shouldn't go off on frolics looking for racism when we have, you know, it was a very limited point. That was a very limited point uh, in effect about alternative explanations for disparities that we see. Um, so I'm not setting myself up as any kind of comprehensive guru on affirmative action. I also wrote another article about affirmative action on not dreaming of affirmative action, which had a very narrow sort of quarry of making a point about two different mindsets. It was really about the psychology of affirmative action more than about uh, the quantitative effects of affirmative action, which I did... I, for which I did not claim to have definitive data. Uh, so it's easy to sort of call me a gadfly, call me a cherry picker, when in fact I'm not 
engaged in the very project that they claim I am engaged with. I am making surgical a surgical set of points uh, that I think are a useful contribution to the conversation. Uh, you know, is affirmative action something we should continue to do or not? Frankly, I think that's a complicated question. Here would be my only assertion about it. If we're going to engage that question, if we even care, and I think there are reasons we should care, uh, it's because, once again, of this incessant demand for equality of results, there is... I think, Glenn, maybe you wouldn't agree with me, this constant drumbeat of demand for equality of results. And if those results, equalities are not forthcoming, then, you know, something must be done. I think that is a very deforming development uh, in our uh, national life, right? So if we are going to have this demand for equality of results and we are going to have these affirmative action programs, Let's at least have them based on reality and not on fantasy, because we will never get it right if the predicate for our discussion is untruth. I, I can't imagine how we could. It just doesn't work that way. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you think that we can come to the right answer if we suppress facts. Let, let me say what I think, and I'll, I'll be brief because we've been going on for a while, but since you've invited this, I despair of the fact that we African Americans have become so dependent upon affirmative action in order to penetrate elite venues. This is now 40 years plus in the doing. Uh, we're very well down this path. I remember when Nathan Glazer, the sociologist at Harvard, wrote a book called Affirmative Discrimination. It was in the 1970s. Everybody got mad at him because he raised some fundamental questions about affirmative action at that time, and everyone thought it was sacrosanct. Well, it's still sacrosanct, but a lot of the questions that a guy like Nat Glazer was raising 35, 40 years ago have shown themselves to be entirely valid things to worry about. Uh, what about damage to the reputation of African Americans, the stigma associated with the generalized presumption that their presence is dependent upon some special dispensation? What about the disincentives that are created for people who are striving and who know in advance that they don't need a 4.0 GPA in order to get into Penn Law School? They can get in with a 3.3 GPA or whatever the number is. Um, what about the impact on others who are not in the protected categories? There are questions of justice here. You can't just slough them off. Yeah, we haven't I mean, mentioned justice. No, we haven't, even, we haven't even mentioned them. But the Asian uh, students who are being discriminated against because of affirmative action for African-Americans and Latinos, and I might add, protection of whites against the implications of allowing Asian admissions to run uh, rampant while continuing to practice affirmative action. I mean, there is an issue here of the fact that one of the reasons why the Asians are getting short change, and I believe they are getting short change in the admissions process, is that we don't want to reduce the number of whites and we don't want to reduce the number of blacks and we don't want to reduce the number. What about all of that? Uh, what about the insidious corrupting effects of this relaxation of meritocratic standard on the subsequent practice of pedagogy? I mean, uh, Harvey Mansfield at Harvard got into trouble for suggesting that some source of grade inflation might be people not wanting to grade harshly the poor performances of some people in their classrooms because they're in categories that are protected and admitted by affirmative action. But it is at least something to think about. What about the relativism, the camel's nose of relativism that comes in under the tent, where people start saying meritocracy, meritocracy what are you talking about? Uh, a cult of smartness. They're worshiping smartness and they derogate the very idea that some people are bright and are, are able to master very rarefied and difficult kinds of skills more effectively than other people, which is just a fact about the world uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I'm and, and so now we're in this position. We African-Americans, this is Glenn Lowry speaking. You ask and I know I'm soliloquizing a little bit, but I'll just finish. We're in this position where you dare not speak the truth. I mean, come on. The thing that's happening to you. You're being demoted, punished, uh, somehow sanctioned because you have an opinion uh, is an open invitation for people to challenge universities. OK, you say Amy Wax is wrong. Well, show me that she's wrong. Tell me what these numbers are. I want to know. And believe me, believe me, it will not redound 
to the reputational benefit of African Americans for us to know those numbers. Well, I, what's interesting here is we have so a we're new in a cul-de-sac. Era in which I, I'm sorry, I just want to finish. We're, we're in a cul-de-sac. We're in a cul-de-sac. We we have walked nobody ourselves into a blind alley. Nobody feels they have to back up what they say with evidence, which is something new. I mean, they, <clears throat> it's amazing that they get away with it, but they do because it's so important that these facts not be disclosed. That. Um, the institution is is allowed to get off the hook and not disclose them for our assessment or evaluation. Once again, we wouldn't be pressing for that except that, you know, someone is being. So I don't know whether I'm being accused of actually getting the facts wrong or whether I'm uh, guilty for getting the facts right. I, I, I'm really even not sure what the accusation <laughs> is here at this point. Uh, it kind of doesn't matter, Glenn. It kind of doesn't matter. Uh, and, you know, the performance art of, of taking a course away from me. I mean, as my daughter said, first world problems, mom. I mean, honestly. Uh, <laughs> Well, some people say that you've been given the, they've done you a favor now. If all my teachers were elective courses and I never had to face classes of 85 or 90 students, that'd be a pretty good world. Um, anyway, Amy, uh, it's time to call it a day. Um, thanks for coming on the show. I don't know what's next for you, but uh, hang in there. I just read that uh, leader of Black Lives Matter, Pennsylvania, has demanded that you be fired and threatened the university with disruptive acts unless you're fired. Some tells me you're not going to be fired from the Penn Law School. I'm not we'll too see. worried about that. I wouldn't but, put uh, anything past them at this point, but I think giving in to outside agitators, as we call them, might not be a wise strategy. We'll see. Okay, take good care of yourself. Thank you, and thank you for this interesting uh, session. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.